Hey, what's happening, party people? It's your favorite leather craftsman, the leather cowboy right here, Premier Leather Crafters in the dirty. The dirty is where I lay my head. Now, this is take two. Actually, I shot this video live yesterday, but around the six-minute mark, my microphone died. So, I know the audio is going to sound a little bit more rich than it did yesterday, and that's because I'm shooting this without the microphone. I'm having the microphone charged up. But thank you guys for tuning in. I thank you guys for even noticing that because I didn't even do the replay. Most times when you're doing a live video, you want everything to work. You know, and that's how it is in life. You want everything to work when you're in that zone and you're in that flow. But thanks to a subscriber who came in and gave me, uh, gave me the heads up that the sound had died around six minutes. So we're going to shoot this one all over again. And this is talking about the customized valet tray. Um, now, giving you guys a more thorough insight of what happened, or just a recap for me, but it's going to be original for you, is I was walking to the corner store, and it's this great big, I don't even know what kind of leaf this is called. It might be called a, a oak leaf. Um, but I didn't see any acorns, but whatever type of leaf it is, this is the actual leaf size that I found, uh, just walking to the corner store, minding my own business. And what I saw was, what amazed me was how big this leaf is. So I know it has to be an old tree. And I was like, you know, I can do something with that real cool. And, and my first thoughts was, what can I possibly do with it? So I picked it up, brought it to the house, uh, and like I tell you guys about making patterns, you can make a pattern on anything. So here it is again, the good old cereal box is what I laid this leaf on, and I take the leaf down to the box, and I took my knife, and I cut it out to what you see here. Also, I went ahead and just drew the veins just like it was in the original leaf. Uh, now what I did, as I was drawing this out, I, my mind started thinking about this would make a cool custom valet tray. And then I was like, how am I going to make it work? That's the beautiful part about this industry that we're in uh, as leather crafters. We can, uh, a lot of the things that we make, we take out of nature, so to speak. So a lot of the, uh, the Sheridan design or the Vassal's design or the uh, whichever uh, design you are trying to put or, or that you do put on your leather, um, we have tools, tools that make those designs become more lifelike. And so when I was sitting there thing, I said, man, this will make a cool, a cool valet tray. Now, for those of you who don't know what a valet tray is, a valet tray is just this little um, rectangular or square shaped leather box or tray, so to speak. That's why we get a term tray from. Uh, and basically, you just put your chains, whatever's in your pocket, your chains, your keys. Um, I've made one that was a little oblong or rectangular shape where you can just put your bills or your letters uh, in, in it. It's just basically, a, I, in the South, I would call it a whatnot tray because you can put whatnot in there, whatever you want in there. So uh, when I was putting this together, I said, okay, this will make a cool valet tray. So as, I, as you guys can see where, I, where these little black dots are, this is where I'm going to stitch the corners together and it's going to make this tray start to have a shape, kind of resemblance of how a actual leaf or flower petal uh, would look when as it starts to die out or decompose. Now that's the effect and the symbol, uh, the, the effect that I'm going for. It's kind of like when you see the leaves start to die because they've been disconnected from the life source of the tree, they will start to roll up and have this kind of effect as it's dying. So this is the overall effect of what we're going for. Uh, and this is going to make that actually the tray part to where you can start putting stuff into the bottom of it. Now, more so, this is going to be more of a conversation piece. Because whoever buys this or whoever I sell this to, uh, that's what, I mean, it's going to be that, that type of item that you have 
on your bar or your 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 fireplace mantle or your coffee table or even your your dresser nightstand where you just put your whatnots in. So, but when people see it or their their guests see it, it's going to be like, hey. Where did you get that from? That's a cool design. That's what we're going to go for. Now, this also falls into that category of small projects that can make you a lot of money. Customized valet trays, just the regular square ones or the rectangular ones, and you can make them whatever size you want. Pretty much across the board, depending on your skill set and how much artistry and craft that you put into the project, they go anywhere from 25 to $55, $65, depending on the size, artistry, the craftsmanship, and what all you do to it. But this was going to fall into that specialized field. Uh, I was on Etsy once, and I saw that Etsy had some heart-shaped ballet trays, which was, whoever that crafter was, that was a cool concept to come up with. And it was just a regular heart-shaped tray. Uh, and I can imagine how they molded that particular tray you can go to uh, like Dollar Tree and Dollar Tree have the little glass candy bowls that you can go over there and buy for a dollar and I if it was me this is what I would have done um, I would have taken my leather after I cut the pattern out I would have soaked it in water and then I would have uh, wrapped it around that heart shaped candy bowl and clipped it with clothespins um, I, I have clothespins around here somewhere uh, that you guys can, uh, so you'll know how we actually put those together. Uh, let me find my clothespin. Well, I got them around here somewhere, but an actual wooden clothespin. And so once you once once the leather is wet and you wrap it around there, you just put your clothespins on there. Now, reason why I say clothespins, clothespins are not the the pinch is not hard enough to where it's going to leave a mark onto the leather. However, now what you can also do is go back to your trusted painter's tape or masking tape, and then you can just wrap it around, tape it around that bowl until the water starts to evaporate and dry out. The only thing that I don't like about the water method is, uh, well, the masking tape method is the residue, the adhesion residue that's on there. Now, there's a way to do that. You can tape it backwards or reverse. So you would have the non-sticky side against your leather. And once you wrap it all the way around, you would just connect the sticky to the sticky. And then you don't have to worry about that residue being on your leather project. So those are other tips and secrets that you guys can utilize and do into that. But do not be afraid overall. Do not be afraid to just... Get your inspiration or your creativity from nature. Uh, even if you're doing your, your sharing of designs or uh, in your leather carving work, uh, I am partial to angel bells. Angel bells in the South is just kind of like a great flower that you can use. And there's not too many crafters in the industry that uses angel bells. You'll see a lot use daisies. You'll see a lot use... Um, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the flower. The, the lilies, you'll see a lot of crafters use lilies. You'll see a lot of them use daisies. But you can actually take that particular flower, and if you're starting in the business and you don't have your niche yet, adopt you a flower that's partial to your craft to be known by you. So oftentimes, and I say that because when I see, uh, if I was a seller project, and now I'm not saying that I'm the only crafter in the industry that's using angel bells. But odds are, especially if it's in the south or the southern regions of the country, if I see a piece that's done with angel bells, it's going to draw my attention. And then after that point, I'm going to start looking for, for my maker's mark. Now, my maker's mark, and I tell you guys again, this is a maker's mark that I had made by a, a, a company in Jacksonville, Florida. But it has my logo or my maker's mark, which we call in the leather craft business. This is my maker's mark here. And it's just, the rec there it is, the leather cowboy. I, I, my, my logo is the cowboy hat. And then I have across the bottom of it, Premier Leather Crafters that's stamped into that. So 
Let's get right off into this, ladies and gentlemen, because I don't want to take you long. The video yesterday was a great one. Oh, man, I was in poetry emotion doing that video, but I didn't have any sound to it. So let's get right back to this. So what you guys are going to get wind of the day is um, not just the part to where I traced it out and put it, put my pattern down, but you guys are actually going to see me to where I actually already went ahead and traced it to my leather and I've already cut my veins. These are what they call the leaf veins. These veins here, of course, you know, I'm just going to give you a quick science class just because I love you. But the veins are the ones that transport the chloroform or the chlorophyll throughout the leaf. And that's what gives it that green color that gives it life and lets you see what it is. Uh, and, because, and then uh, all the way down to the stem here. Now, what I'm also going to do is, unlike yesterday, I'm going to, uh, once I get all of my tooling work done to where I'm going to recess these veins to make it look a little bit more lifelike, uh, then I'm going to go ahead and punch my sewing holes where I'm going to go ahead and get this prepped and ready. Now, once after that part here, and I'm not going to bore you guys with watching the whole entire video of, of me tooling and doing this out. So there will be a part two, which today would have been the part two of me actually doing the mold on it. So I'm going to follow this up with a part two on tomorrow. Uh, today is the seventh. So uh, tomorrow on the eighth, if you guys are following the channel, which I hope you are following and a subscriber to the channel. So when I do these videos, you will get that notification and bell to your, uh, to your inbox or to your notification side on YouTube as well as social media. And you guys can come in and finish watching the final piece. So let's get to work, ladies and gentlemen. I've already cased this, which casing, you guys have already know by watching me long enough, casing is where we go ahead and pre-wet the leather. And I'm going to give you the tools that I'm going to use to um, to do the tooling work on this. Now, one thing of note, and what I love about doing this leaf pattern is it's primarily all straight lines. All of these are all just straight lines. Very few, um, and they might have a few curvatures to it, but it's nothing really outlandish. So if you, uh, in your beginner's kit, if you still have your just square blade, and this is the square blade that I've had ever since 1995 when I first started out. And, and then of course you upgrade to your, swell, uh, your angle blades and get your ceramic blades and your ruby tips and all of that. That's when you start getting a little, you start making a little money and start investing into your tools. But uh, the square blade works best when you're cutting primarily straight lines. Uh, it, what I love about this square blade is it, did, it gives a deep, broad cut. Because if you look at this blade tip here, that is pretty wide. So it's going to really cause that separation in your leather when you're cutting this. And this is why I love the, the square blade on primarily uh, straight line cuts. So, but uh, this is what I put into the video yesterday. But we're going to come right back. And now I'm going to come back to uh, start to bevel this. Now, what I'm going to use is a, sm a smooth angled beveler. Uh, let me see if I can get this in where you guys can see that. A smooth angled beveler. This is a Tandy's craft tool. So shout out to Tandy. I'm still trying to get Tandy to give me an endorsement and a sponsorship. So come on, Tandy. I've been with y'all ever since I started, man. I, we, we've been the, we've had a perfect marriage for almost 30 years. So come on, give a little bit. Give a little bit, Tandy. Wink, wink. Uh, but this is a Tandy Craft tool right here. It's a smooth angle beveler. You can see how smooth and, and what I love about this one is it has a, a subtle rounded edge. So it's going to work perfect with the veins that have a nice curvature. And then for the ones that I really want to define, I'm going to use this smooth, smooth beveled uh, angle, um, smooth beveled uh, tool here. And this is built on a, as, not as deep as a uh, pitch as the, the, this one here, but it has a steeper pitch to where I really want to get around. So I'm really going to use this tool around the stem. 
because I really want to cause that separation from the stem just as it is in a real leaf. Uh, so if you're looking at a leaf, you can see that subtle hump in there, but it's more defined than the veins of the leaf. So we're going to use incorporate both of these two tools here. So let me give you guys the numbers off of these. Um, the bigger one here, the bigger bevel tool that we're going to use for the veins. This is going to be F896, F896. You can find these at your Tandy store, or you can pretty much find them at any leather supply store that makes or sells tools. Um, uh, but again, this is these are all Tandy tools that I'm uh, giving you guys. F896, and then the one that I'm going to use on the, the stem, uh, the main portion of the leaf. This one here is a craft tool also, and this is B200. B200, bevel 200. And this is going to be the steep bevel tool here uh, on that deep. Uh, I would say it's a, a 35 or 45 angle. And you can get these now. I would encourage you, especially if you're doing a lot of tooling work or a lot of carving work, invest in your smooth, your smooth angled bevelers, or uh, and as well as your checkered bevelers. You want to put your money into those, and it gives you a lot of different effects to your artwork. So let's get busy right now, ladies and gentlemen, before this starts to dry out anymore. Uh, and we're going to get this thing right to work. So I'm going to angle my camera down. Let me get this light right so you guys can see how this is going to work. So the main part of this I'm going to do is the stem first. And now it doesn't matter if you start at the bottom or the top. The reason why I start at the bottom, and this is just a, a, another little quick, uh, can I say tip, or it's not really a secret, but I'm going to give it to you as a secret because it's going to only in, in, enhance your leather crafting. I'm going to start at the base of the stem. Why is that? Because the base uh, right here where the, uh, at the base of this leaf where the stem meets the flower coming off of the tree. Uh, when you're first starting out tooling, your impressions are going to be a lot deeper here because of the constant repetition of the tapping. And then as you get up to the top part of this leaf, is you're going to be a little tired, so you're not going to hit as hard. And then it's going to make it a little bit more lifelike effect because as the stem goes up to the top of the leaf, it's going to have that subtle look where the beveling shouldn't be as defined as the base. So let's get started right here into this. Now, one, th one thing that I can tell you guys is, um, with this small beveler, you're going to have take some chances on, you're going to see some ticks and pits into your tooling, but don't worry about that. That's why we have our modeling spoon as a backup plan to smooth out all of those little ticks. And I'm going to show you guys that um, as we get more off into this doing that. Now, and don't be afraid to go back over your work, too. And you can see how this line here is starting to get that little good burnished look. So you can already see the definition is already starting to take shape already. And this is how you know that your work has been properly cased. Now, as we get to the top of this leaf, we're not going to put so much uh, pressure into the head on tooling this. And then I'm just going back down the leaf again to cause that good separation in there. A lot of times, uh, a lot of times when you're starting out crafting and you see a lot of work, it's just like, oh man, they do some beautiful work. 
And, and, and how do you get it to have that 3D look? A lot of, uh, uh, basically to give you the, the, the game on that, is it's a lot to do with how much water you put into your leather when you case it. And so the, the, the secret there is to know that your work is properly cased is once you wet this, it's going to turn, it's going to turn a dark color. Any leather will because it's wet now. You want to, you want to wait until the leather almost comes back, well, comes back to its original color. Not almost, but you want to wait till it comes back to its original color. Now, it's still to say that it's wet, but is now able to where you can work with. Now, a cool secret. Now, this part is a secret to how you would definitely know. Take the back of your hand and touch your leather with it. It should be cool to the touch. That's how you know your leather is ready to be worked with. Once it goes back to this original color and you still kind of like, ah, I really don't know. Uh, just take the back of your hand, touch your leather, and if it's cool to the touch, it's good to go. Now, if your leather is still wet when you go to tooling it, it's going to cause one of those oops moments. <laughs> because uh, when leather is wet, you can really manipulate it, and you can really do some unwanted tooling work to it. Uh, and it'll reflect once that water starts to evaporate out. Now, what I'm going to take now, I'm going to take, first I'm going to take my, my uh, small side of this modeling tool to create more of a separation. Then I'm going to take, flip it around and use the bigger end to get it to get that more smooth flow off into the leaf back this way, away from the stem. So, and all I'm going to do is run this down the stem. Now, what I'm doing here is also smoothing out those little ticks and tips to where uh, my tool made. And then I'm just going to run this down here a couple of times. And it's also defining that burnishing. You see how it's getting a little darker? Now, I'm going to flip this around and use my bigger part of the spoon. And it's just going to take out that high-rise ridge. It's just going to make it do a little bit more natural flow. And we're just going to run this down and put a little bit of pressure on, on your spoon and just run this down that side right there. Now, somebody might have the question, well, well, cowboy, can I just take the spoon and do that the same? Yes, you can. The more you run this spoon through your veins and through, and through uh, this stem here, it's going to make it natural more, uh, 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 it's going to make it have a little more natural. Now, in the vein part, I'm really going to use, this is why I didn't take, uh, in the vein part, this tool here is not as steep as the B200. So I'm, I'm going to substitute using the modeling spoon because of the, the steepness and the depth is not going to make it like the uh, stem here. So let's go right back to this one here. And I'm going to just tool this. Just bring this down. Just nice, subtle taps on this. Now, yes, I did flip this around, but I'm still starting at the base and going up. So that's how we, what we want to achieve. Oh, let me drop this in here right real quick. And when I first started out tooling, tooling leather, I used to have these little marks all around anywhere that I beveled or, 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 or tooled any of my work. And it used to drive me bonkers. Where did these marks come from? And you guys will experience this as well, the more, especially the more you get off into crafting. You're going to have these little marks. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, I found out. Let me angle this back up. Uh, guess what I found out those little marks were? My fingernails. When you're tooling, 
<laughs> Let me show you. <laughs> this is funny. When you're tooling, your fingernails are resting on the leather, and as you are moving your tool, your nails are digging into the leather. So, if you don't want those marks like like I had, just clip your fingernails back. That, that's all you got to do. Man, I'm talking about, I, I was really thinking that Tandy, I, I might have bought some bad hide. Now, what we call those, um, if it's natural to the leather, what we call those are range marks and tick bites. Um, sometimes that cow might have gone out uh, and rubbed up against the fence post and it scarred or scratched the leather. Now, those are natural. Or if they have barbed wire fence <clears throat> and, and that cow might have rubbed up against a fence. He could have been in the woods and rubbed up against a, a, a tree a, a, or a limb stick that might have broken off and it scratched him or scarred him. Those are natural scars and marks, so we call them range marks. But anything that happened on the range that's natural to the cow, and then as it healed over, it showed that into reflected into the hide. Now, don't be dismayed at those range marks. And sometimes you can even see the tick bites where a, a tick may have gotten onto the uh, the cow and you'll see those two holes like the spider holes, but where the head of that tick went down into the flesh of the hide. Now, don't again, don't be dismayed at rage marks and tick bites because a lot of times I have put that into or incorporated that into the project. One, that's a selling point, just to give you guys some value. That's the selling point to let the customer know that this is authentic leather and not Naga hide. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and it, I encourage anybody to do that research, uh, how Naga hide was invented or created, because to this day, and I'm 50 years old, I still haven't seen a Naga animal ever. <laughs> I don't, that's that is not real. So, but uh, but you can use that as a selling point to know that uh, when you use selling that those products or projects to a customer that has those natural range marks and tick bites in there. I've even sold projects with the brand, uh, whatever ranch uh, put their brand logo into the cow when they scarred that. I have used that into a project. Actually, I did a purse like that one time to where it had the original ranchers brand on the flap of the purse. And that's what the customer wanted. Normally, a lot of crafters will cut that part out. Don't do that, ladies and gentlemen. Leave that in there. A natural scar into the hide of the cow, leave it in there. You can tool and work around it or make that your centerpiece. Now, every, sometimes a lot of crafters, man, they want to go out and they want to buy the best of the best hide, unblemished, and you can, it's, that's fine. And that's perfectly fine. You can go and spend two, three hundred dollars on some Herman Oak. Uh, you can go and spend two, three hundred dollars on some European oak, uh, European leather. Now, listen, I'm not taking anything away from Herman Oak. European uh, hides or craft men um, hides. I'm not taking anything away from those. They are some beautiful hides. Beautiful. No, rarely ever any blemishes, tick marks, tip bites, and range marks. Rarely. And, and, and it's the prettiest color when you see it. The fibers are real tight onto the flesh side. The fibers are tight and they... They take tooling great. But again, you to me, you have to build up to that 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 level. And especially when you're a beginner or intermediate, don't go in and start dropping two, three hundred dollars on some hide, man, and you really haven't perfected the craft just yet. So um, there, there's nothing wrong with buying uh, some of those lesser grade economy hides. To start with, perfect your technique. And I should have showed you guys these little ticks that's going to leave on there, but I'll show you on another one uh, before I smooth this out. But uh, don't be afraid to buy those pieces 
and incorporate that into your projects. So let's get back down here and get to work. And you can see how this both sides are now darkening up. And you can see the difference between the leaves and then the stem. So we really want to pay attention to that stem and get a nice, good burnish on there. Now, there will come a time when your leather will start to dry out a little bit and you have to recase it. There's nothing wrong with that. Or there's nothing uh, um, that's happening there. So it's not a problem. You just want to mist it. Now, the leather is still wet, but you don't have to wet it as much as you did the initial time. You just want to mist it and then allow that that uh, your water to absorb up into the flesh again. Because you just want to tool it. Now, um, what I would suggest is you don't have to case this as much as uh, or all over the piece, but um, if, if you're starting out, just case the part that you want to work with first. And then you can, uh, once you get this part done, then you can go back and do this part over here. So, or now me, I'm going to be pretty proficient and move pretty quickly. So I'll go ahead and case the whole entire part. But now you guys are getting the gist of how this is taking shape. So let me show you right here. Um, this, this, this defining stem. And we just tool that out. I do want the stem to be more profound and project it out. That's why I tooled that there. And now I'm going to go back and do the veins. Actually, let me go back and do this vein here that's coming off of this one, off of the main stem. And then I'll show you guys those, uh, those little marks that I was talking about. So let's get back down here. Now, and I just told you all wrong. I did the exact thing that I told you not to do. First, you want to wait till the leather starts to pull back to the natural color again before you start tooling that. Now, I guess I... And let me say it like this, ladies and gentlemen. Regardless of how long you have been tooling, you want to stay consistent because it will stay... Uh, uh, it will reflect into your work. So, and I'm a big advocate of um, don't do what I say, do what I do, or, or don't do what I do, do what I say. I, I'm a big advocate against that. So I try to practice what I preach because there is a right and a wrong way to leather craft. And that was the wrong way. So, and I'm not too big to say that I was wrong by go ahead and tooling that before it had properly cased. So you want to make sure that you stay consistent with your work. This is how we're able to command in, uh, those high prices. Uh, and some people would say they're high. But what I have learned is there is nothing too expensive. Somebody will pay for it. And when you factor in your, your, your time, your craftsmanship, your tools, you have to get all of your investment back out of the years, uh, the, the time that you put in. So when people ask me, well, how much is that? Now, when this, is get, when this gets done, this is going to retail for $55. i am going to retail it for $55. Well, man, $55. Well, you're not paying for how long it took me to do it. You're paying for the years of how long it took me to do it. Because I just didn't start doing this and, and then just sat down and just came up with something. Those are anomalies. There are few people in the world that can gravitate, that can grab a craft or grab anything and, 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 and just pop it right on out. The rest of us have been putting in work since 1995. And, and I'm not even an old, uh, I've been crafting a minute, but there are some people that's been doing leather crafting since the 70s and 80s. So when, when you see those people um, that's, that's coming out and selling stuff and, and they're wanting... Uh, $375 for a belt. You're not just paying $375 for a belt. You're paying $375 for 30, 40 years of experience to make that belt look that way. So don't be afraid, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick tip. Don't be afraid to put the price tag based on your years of experience. Um, all right, this is starting to case a little bit better. 
So let's get right back to this and I can show you guys these uh, little marks. And then I'm going to let you go. And as I get closer toward the end, I'm going to slow up a little bit on my tapping. Just to have that subtle look. And I did this on purpose because I want you guys to see these little marks here. Uh, let me see. You might can see them better from this angle here. But you see these little divots? These are all because the tool, uh, I may have pulled the tool a, a little bit too fast and it left a tick, a uh, little, what I call a little tick mark. Not a tick bite, but a little divot from the tool. And it's all along the top part. Now you can pull your tools too fast. And this is why you want to go back over them again to smooth those out. Or... You can come right back here with your modeling spoon. We're going to take the small end, and I'm just going to smooth those marks out right along that vein right there. And you just want to do a subtle push to smooth that out. You can see how that line is getting darker. That's burnishing. And then I'm going to flip it around to my bigger end of my spoon, and then we're just going to take that, take that high rise out and make it a little bit more even flowing. Now, what that's also is doing, too, is, is really defining this main vein that's coming off of the stem of this flower, uh, this leaf. And we're just going to just knock that down a little bit. Now, you can only do this while you are, while your leather is wet. This is the manipulation part of defining definition uh, between the pieces that you're working on. Hey, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and get this finished out finished up so stay tuned for the part two uh well right before i get ready to mold this i'm going to show you what it all looks like uh as it's is being uh finished and then we'll get ready to start to mold it and that will be in video number two i'm the leather cowboy right here from me leather crafters in the dirty south i'll see you guys on the other side keep crafting